Generosity is what we talked about last week. And man, that always is a big hit. People love hearing about generosity and they love talking about how we, how we, uh, you know, we, uh, better to give than receive, you know, that statement of Jesus and that we are the conduit of God's blessing. Remember the little like fire hose thing I had going on here. We make an invisible God visible through our generosity. We talked about that. Uh, finance is the number one reason for, for fights in marriage and, and divorce. It's like one quarter of the reasons is, is uh, finance related. And so it matters to people. And of course, uh, there's nothing, nothing that comes in more via prayer request than financial stuff. Financial stuff is the number one thing. Not even close. You'd think it'd be like health stuff. That stuff comes in too. Relationship stuff, that comes in. Finances is number one. It matters to us and it matters to God too. So last week we talked about blessing people and, you know, people love that because people love to hear about how to be generous on their own terms. <laughs> That's what people love. Like a little bit here, a little bit there when I feel like it. That's what people love hearing about. That kind of generosity is really easy for me to talk about. It's really easy to hear about. Today is going to be a lot less comfortable. I'm just going to put it out there. <laughs> this is going to be a little different and a little less comfortable because there is something that Jesus said about giving and generosity that's not based on our terms. It's based on his terms. So it makes it a little less comfortable, but it doesn't make it any less God's word and something that we ought to consider being important. Let's just get straight to the scripture and, and just cat out of the bag. Luke eleven forty two says, Jesus saying, you should tithe. <laughs> now, before anybody gets up to go to the bathroom, you know, and, and take off for the day, um, before anybody does that, I want to start with, I felt like this, this time, you know, bringing this up, I don't, we don't talk about like this specific issue, like for a whole message very often, but I want to start off with a, an, an apology of sorts. Not that I'm coming at this topic apologetically, because I, I believe it's absolutely true. It's absolutely something that every single believer ought to be engaged in. But I want to apologize because maybe you've seen some bad stuff in churches before. Maybe you've, um, maybe you've uh, encountered a leader that didn't have the, the, the best amount of integrity. And so I want to, you know, just kind of the elephant in the room. Maybe you should struggle with this topic because whenever a pastor or a leader or anybody talks about this issue, it's just hard to trust. It's hard to trust like what, what is going on there? What's, what's this issue? I, I, if you just have any kind of struggle with that, it's, it might be because some people have handled the issue wrongly. And so I want to, on behalf of any leader or organization that has betrayed your trust, I apologize for them. But I today would like to redeem this conversation. I'd like to bring it back up in a life-giving way in a way that is true to the sincerity of the word of God, but also sensitive to those of you that may have experienced something like that, because that's not lost on me. I do know that that happens. I do know. Um, so it's not possible. This is like my first kind of thought, my first statement that I wanted to bring up when talking about this, this subject is you cannot remove finances from faith. You can't remove your faith from finances. Our, our, our faith in Christ ought to impact every single area of our lives. Isn't that true? Like every area. If I believe in Christ, if I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God, God created the whole universe and the whole world, what area should I leave out of that? Money? Of course not. I mean, it's, it's obvious. It's obvious that every single area of our lives ought to be included in our life of faith. Just like you should not try to separate intimacy and marriage, just like you should not try to separate uh, diet and exercise, as many of us try. Come on, somebody, man. Like, I, I don't mind going to the gym, but I also like some brownies. Brownies. It's like, just give me some brownies. I'll just hit the gym extra. But these, these two things are like peas and carrots, okay? They're, they go together. These things go together. Well, faith and everything goes together. That's what I'm trying to say is that there's no, there's no area where we go, oh, well, that, that doesn't matter. No, I just leave this over here. That doesn't matter to me. Regardless of a bad experience, which again, I'm, I'm, I'm letting you know, I, I see you. If that's, if that's you, I do see you. But if not, maybe it's just on the inside, you go, I don't know. And there's nothing really happened to you, but it's just hard. Hey, I appreciate that too. It's just hard to, to reconcile me living my actual life and trying to pay my own bills. But then it says something like this, which if you don't know what this, this subject is, tithing or the, what Jesus said, tithe, we're going to get into all that. Just hang with me. Hang with me. 
Um, you'll see that by the end of this, this message and by the end of this talk that um, this is really a very life-giving thing. And, and God wants the best for you. He wants life for you. He, wants, he doesn't need anything from you. He wants everything for you. So let's dive into this, this statement that Jesus said. He said, you should tithe. Very blunt, very straightforward. But if you've got anything other than an NLT, it might not read that way. Like the version, the translation of the Bible that you use. I use an NLT because, you know, me in school, we got along real good, a little too good. You know, I made, I, I was very social, you know, uh, homeschool kids, you know, they, everybody complains, man, they're not going to be socializing. And then you go to school and what do you get in trouble for? Socializing. That's right. <laughs> so I got in trouble for socializing too much. And so, you know, I just, I, I prefer a, a book or a translation that's, that's real easy to read. So the NLT is actually a translation that's about a sixth grade reading level. And so it says things and translates the Old Testament scriptures into English in a very sixth grader can understand kind of way. And when we do that, the statement comes out, you should tithe. Yes, you should. But let's just for, you know, let, let's read a more uppity version. Uppity. Yeah, like the ESV, you know, the new King James, thou art so holy, Lord. And it's like, it's beautiful. It's very poetic. I love it. Um, but if it's supposed to be translated into English, let's use English that we all use, eh? But just for the sake of argument, let's say let you look down at your Bible and it doesn't say exactly that. So let's, let's see what it says in another translation. Uh, Luke eleven forty two 42, out of the ESV, English Standard Version. It's not standard English for me, but it might be standard English for you. It says this, woe to you. I can't remember the last time I said woe to anybody. Maybe like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Nice polo, bro. Whoa. Like just, but whoa is a bad thing. It's whoa. Whoa to you Pharisees. You tithe mint. I know what mint is. It's like the little, and so the, the Pharisees, they'd grab their little mint and they'd get a little handful and they, that's 10% of that. And rue, I seriously don't know what rue is. I use on word processor. I'm like synonym for rue is like, you'll rue the day, but I think it's a plant. I don't know. You can come and teach me afterwards. I'm very receptive, very teachable. Okay, so teach me what rue means. Type it in the comments if you know what rue is. No cheating. If you Google it, I'm not listening. Well, I'm just kidding. You tie the mint and the rue and every herb. Is it herb or herb? I don't know. One of them means a drug. The other one means like it goes in your, goes in your salad. And you neglect the justice and love of God. All right, so Pharisees, you're tithing everything you're supposed to be tithing, everything, even the little plants. Like, you're not just tithing your paycheck, you're tithing off the plants, 10% of my little mints, everything, everything. But you are neglecting the justice and love of God. And it says, these you ought to have done without neglecting the other. So this is a high school reading level. How do you like that? High schoolers, ESV is for you. I don't know, I'm... I'm 38 years old. I still prefer the NLT. I'm just saying right there. But they, they say things a little different. They say the same thing, just in a different way. You should do this and not forget about that. You should do both. There's really no other way to translate it. Just the simplest way, in my opinion, is you should tithe, yes, without neglecting the love of God. Without neglecting justice, you should, tithe, you should do both. Not do either. And I believe just based on the entirety of scripture, the entirety of the New Testament, when, when Jesus is correcting the Pharisees all the time, they would do stuff for show. So it's like they would, they would have their tithe in hand and they would step over people to bring it. And he's saying, you, sh you should be tithing, but don't step on people on your way. So it's not one or the other. It's Jesus said, you ought to do both. You ought to do both of these things. So some might argue, um, I've never heard anybody say this, but I was just trying to imagine things that people might argue with this. And some might argue that he just said that in passing, that Jesus just said this, he didn't really mean it. Like he just, oh, you ought to tithe. Yeah, but the more important stuff, and I'm just gonna say this because it's not important. Now that's, I don't know, even, even thinking of it, it sounds kind of ridiculous because you think Jesus would say anything he didn't mean? Really? Really? Do you really think Jesus, this is red letters. Do so you think Jesus would say something he didn't mean? Of course not. Of course not. Matthew 12, 36 says this. I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. Jesus is not guilty of this sin of speaking idle words. No, he meant everything he said. I, I, I urge you to be very careful in being dismissive of this principle. And from here until the end of the message, I'm going to refer to tithing as a principle, not a law, not a rule. It's a principle. 
It's a principle, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain why right here. Because the biggest argument, the one I hear most of, the one anybody hears most of, the one that most people have is, oh, that's the Old Testament. That's Old Testament law. That's too legalistic of a standard. I hear this regularly. It's, it's too legalistic. It's not supposed to be that way. It's supposed to be just whatever. Like whatever you feel like, whenever, maybe, just like, that's, it's too legal. It's not supposed to be so, so legalistic. That's what people say. But tithing, and what I want to explain is tithing existed before the law ever came to be. Most people don't realize this. You, you've seen it if you've read the Bible, but, you, but maybe you didn't catch it. So let's, let's talk about this for just a moment. I'll try, to, I'll try to just like go right through this and not labor too much because some of this stuff is really deep. But I want to, I want to let you know that this, is, this should help us to understand that this is for all time. It's a principle. Genesis chapter 4 says this. This is talking about uh, Cain and Abel, um, Adam and Eve's kids. All right. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. Now notice these words, in the course of time, Cain brought some. It doesn't say how much, but it definitely says it was a portion of some kind. It was some portion. I would, you know, I would stretch out and say, maybe it was 10% of it. I don't know. Brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And that was in the course of time. But Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from, again, some. It doesn't say exactly how much. But it says firstborn. Firstborn. So Cain was over the course of time. Abel was first, like these are the firstborn flocks. Like I didn't have more flocks because I gave the firstborn ones that were born, firstborn. The Lord looked on, on the Lord looked uh, with favor on Abel. So Abel was able to give a good offering. That's how I remember um, how, who did what. And then, but with Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. Okay. So what happened here? What, what happened in this story? Many people would ask, you know, what, what's the difference why is there a difference between these two offerings? Like what, what happened? So Abel's again, Abel's was the first born. Abel brought what was first. He brought it first. And then some, I'd say 10%. Again, I just, I'm, I'm just spitballing. It doesn't say that, but I, w- I would have to guess it was some portion, some portion. And Cain's was either not 10% or it wasn't first. Something was different about it. Something was different. It's not like God didn't like plants and he liked me. That's not it. But in the scripture, the only difference I can see is over the course of time, Cain brought some, but Abel brought the first. And so this is not even like exactly that tithing is the Old Testament principle yet. It's more of what we give to God ought to be out of our first and best. So that kind of refutes this idea of, well, you know, whatever, whenever. So this... and. But the real point, honestly, this is way, 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 don't even know exactly, but thousands of years before the law, thousands of years before the law. You can make some argument how many years it was. All I know is it was long, 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 long before. But here's something more specific and a little bit more recent, but still before the law, Genesis 14, 10 chapters later, about a man named Abraham. Maybe you heard of Abraham, but this is before his name was Abraham. His name was Abram, Abram. Uh, and a man named Melchizedek, okay? So now we're gonna get super teachy, very big time Bible word here, but Bible character that people love to talk about in a, in a, like a Bible class or a Bible study, Melchizedek. Well, this is just grazing through this story right here. Abraham just gets done conquering all these kings. He has this huge amount of loot. It's a payday, everybody. It's a huge payday. And it's the spoils of war that he has. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, which means the king of peace, the king of peace. That's what Salem is, peace. So the king of peace, I was just reading my Bible plan this morning. There's someone else named the king of peace or the prince of peace. You know who that is? That's Jesus. Okay. Some would say that Melchizedek is a type and shadow of, of Jesus, but I'm not, I'm not talking about that today. The king of Salem, he brought that and a priest of God most high brought Abram some bread and wine. Melchizedek blessed Abram with this blessing. Blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. Be blessed and blessed be God most high who has defeated your enemies for you. Then Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth or a tithe of all the goods he had recovered. This was 430 years before Moses ever came down with the tablets and there was ever a law. There was no such thing as legalism to the law back then because there was no law. This was still very fluid. People were just kind of going for it. But a tenth? That seems real specific. That seems like, why? Why? Because I'm trying to explain is this is not just a legalistic thing. This is not just a thing that came with the law of Moses. And now we're we're trying to be legalistic now that we're, we're saying this. No, this was before the law and after. 
which I'm going to explain to you. Finally, on this idea that if this is Old Testament, tithing's Old Testament, you shouldn't do it, you shouldn't have to do it. We live under the new covenant, and we do. <laughs> Quotes, we really do. We really do live under the new covenant. But did you know that Jesus raised the standard on, 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 on pretty much everything I could think of off the top of my head? He raised the standard on everything. He raised the standard on everything. He, uh, the, the law said you shouldn't cheat on your spouse. You shouldn't, you shouldn't commit adultery. But Jesus came in and said, I don't even want you looking at that woman. Okay, did that get like, did that stay the same or did it get even more of a standard? It got more. And then the law said you should murder. And Jesus came in and said, no, I don't even want you to be angry at your brother. Okay, did the standard go up, down, or stay the same? That's like, okay, now I can't even do this. The law said, bring a tithe into the storehouse for the supplication of all the believers and so that there'll be food in the house. And Jesus said, I want you to give everything. I want you to give everything. Well, he said it to one man, but there's, there's a great, great argument. You could, you, could make a, you could make a good case that Jesus does ask for everything, that a man gives up his life to follow the Lord. We give up everything of, of ourselves. And so it's not just a, you're right. You're right. It's not the law anymore. Actually, the standard has gone up. Tithing doesn't sound so bad anymore, does it? <laughs> it's like, all right, everybody, <laughs> whatever you got, bring it. No, no, it's, it's seriously, in a serious note, Jesus affirmed the tithe. He affirmed it with his own mouth um, and called us to be generous. Almost everyone can define generosity, but not everyone can define tithing. So let's talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of this and, and describe what this is. This is not a church word, actually. Tithing is not a church word. This, a tithing is a uh, math word. It's a math word. Um, I brought a little illustration with me. This, this coin right here, this little, this little piece right here with George Washington's mugshot on it. Does anybody know the name of this coin right here? George Washington. It's, it's a quarter, everybody. It's, it's a quarter. You're like, I don't know George. Lincoln? Is it Lincoln? Is it Benjamin Franklin? No, no, this is a quarter. This is a quarter. This is named after the fraction that it represents. It's called a quarter. Well, there is a, another word that describes a fraction that it represents. That's the tithe. It represents one-tenth. So like Jewish people would say, hey, can I have a tithe of those olives? And they just mean a tenth. It's just a math phrase that is used almost exclusively for this 10% representative number that's supposed to come into the storehouse. The tenth is just all it means. A tithe simply means a tenth. That's, that's exactly what the word means. So let there be no mystery anymore. What's a tithe? It means one-tenth. So that's what it is. What about where? Where, where? Okay. All right. It's a tenth of, of what I earn, of what I make, a tenth of my produce. Well, you might not have peas and carrots. You might not have vegetables, but you produce something. You, you produce, you know, resources. So a tenth of that, where does it go? Um, the Bible says the storehouse. Well, what storehouse? This is referring to the house of the Lord, the house where his, he chooses to make his name abide, where we worship God together. The scripture on it is out of Deuteronomy 26. It says, put some of the first, there's that word again. This is supposed to be first. So there's a timing issue here too. It's supposed to be the first that we bring in. The first of your produce from each of your crop uh, that you harvest into a basket, bring it to the designated place of worship, the place the Lord your God chooses to make his name honor, for his name to be honored, all right? So what this is saying is your home church. If you're visiting today, like there's some folks I don't recognize in here, even though it's dark, I still see you. I love you. I see you, but I haven't seen you very many times before. If this is not your home church, this isn't where your tithe goes. I, I mean, it's all good. It's just the Bible. The Bible says where, where you worship God together. Like, where do you worship God together? That's, that's where it goes. It doesn't go, you know, wherever, like, you send it over here, I send it over here. I've, I've experienced that. I've heard people say, well, I just kind of do whatever I want. No, God says bring it, bring it here because this is how I intend to bless the world is through the local church. It's through the storehouse. It's so that there would be food in the house. The designated place of worship, this is, that's what it is, and that's where it goes, but why? Here's the, to me, the most important part is why? <laughs> Come on, man. Like we've been doing this. I, I, we've been doing this before we were pastors, since before we were married. And the most important thing in my heart, in my mind is why? Like what, what specifically about this? And I, I think one of the best reasons why is found in Proverbs chapter three. Proverbs chapter three is the same chapter that talks all about trust. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Right after that, it says honor the Lord with your wealth. If I had a title for today's message, it would be 
honor God. This, this is intended to be a gesture that honors God with our wealth, with our finance, with our lives. This is a huge area of our lives, whether we you know, feel free to admit it or not. This is a huge area, and it was back then too. Come on, livelihood, your food, your groceries, your, your provision for your family, this is a huge deal. And God says, I want you to honor me though. And so this is the book of wisdom. This is a chapter on trust. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. <laughs> with the best part, with the first part, the firstborn, then he will fill your barns with grain, your vats will overflow with good wine. And so there's a little promise tacked on there. Thank you, Lord. But I'm still struggling. <laughs> I'm still struggling. All God asks us to do is acknowledge him. Remember and acknowledge him as our provider. That's what this is all about. He's our provider with every paycheck, after every job, every time I get increased. And Tiffany and I have been doing this since I mean, since as far back as I can remember, everything that comes in, because we just learned early on, it's like birthday money. <laughs> whatever, whatever comes in, honestly, honestly, whatever comes in, it's like I want to honor God with it because anything that, I, that comes into my possession that I don't honor God with feels like I did it. feels like it, I earned it. It's mine. No, this is mine. God, and it's like a little tiny, and it's mine. And believe me, it happens to all of us. All right, I may have a microphone in my hand. I might be standing on the platform, but I have to check myself too sometimes, and go, I'm going to honor God. I'm going to honor God with what comes to me. Um, I, I just, uh, I wrote something down, and I, I, I spelled it all out because, and I, and I want to read it because I don't want to say it wrong, because I, I wrote it out very specifically as a, as a prayer that we could say when we're bringing this in, when, when we're bringing it in, or when we're, you know, it's on the phone sometimes, you know, with the, with the app, or maybe it's a check or whatever, but as we're going through this, as we're saying this, there's a statement that I wrote down. It's in my notes, and it goes like this. Just I'm going to say it real slow, and, and maybe we can just feel this and remember it as we go through it. It's, God, you are the one who gave me the health to live and work and make money, and you are the one who gave me the skill and the intelligence to do what I do. Lord, I, you gave me the opportunity I have to make the money I have. So first things first, I'm going to honor you as my provider by bringing a tenth to my home church where I come to worship you. That's what this is all about. It's about honoring God. It's about putting him first. Say, Lord, I, I know it's like I applied for the job. I did well in the interview. They hired me. This is my money, right? This is mine. But in, in this statement, as I wrote it out, it was like, no, I, I don't have anything that's all mine. My life is his. He gave me everything I have, all my intuition, all my, all, all, whatever intelligence I have, whatever skills I have. Lord, those are yours too. You gave all that to me. I, I bring everything back to you and I honor back to you because you are the one that gave me everything. You opened the doors that I could not have opened, the ones that I can't even see. You think that's ever happened? You think that maybe God opened a door or two in your life and that maybe you found out later, man, that's crazy I got that job. It's crazy I, I made all those payments. I'm crazy. God won't always wait until you honor him with the tithe to bless you. Sometimes he'll bless you first because <laughs> so, he loves to bless us. He loves to take care of us. But I'm telling you this, and we're going to talk about this. I'm going to explain it real clear. God wants to, oh, he wants to be present in that area so much more. So much more than, than maybe possibly he is. And I know I'm speaking to a church that largely is really, really good about this. I think percentage-wise, we have a really great percentage of, of givers and people that are, are doing all this. So I'm, I'm halfway preaching to the choir, and then the other half is like encouraging those of you who might be still on the fence with this, still might be on the fence. Tithing is not, is not how good the pastor preached that day. Thank God. <laughs> I'm just saying, but I've heard that. I've heard people say that, you know, uh, I've, I've literally had people say to me, man, I like it when they take the offering at the end, because when the pastor does a good job, I'll put in a little bit more. And I'm like, dang, <laughs> you know, you think I don't think about that still to this day a little bit. I'm like, geez, that's okay. No pressure. No pressure. It's fine. But you better show up. <laughs> you better do good. Tithing is not about that. It's not about how good the, the, the preacher preached that day or how good the pastor is. Whew. It's not about what bills the church has that month. It's about 
us honoring God. It's not about external things. It's about, it's, it's in here. This is me putting you first, saying, God, I, I trust you. Not only do I trust you, I'm honoring you. I know everything I have comes from you. And I'm showing you doing what exactly you said to do. And that is the gesture he asks for. And that is also his plan for provision in the world. So switching gears a little bit, let's switch gears to honor and just talk a little bit more about honor. The whole book of Malachi, I don't know if anybody realized this or not, but the last book in your Bible, Malachi, you can thumb there right now if you got your Bible with you. I know I've been training you to just use your phone, but if you brought a Bible with you, open it up to Malachi and you can like kind of see in the chapters, starting in chapter one, it's all about honoring God. The whole book is all about honoring God. Malachi chapter one, verse six says this, a son honors his father and a servant respects his master. If I am your father and master, where are the honor and respect that I deserve? And then he goes through this list, Malachi does, speaking on behalf of the Lord, listing the ways that people had stopped honoring him. And and money is on the list, but it's the last. It's one of the last on the list, not the last, but one of the last on the list. Chapter one was about the leaders because everything rises and falls with with leadership. If the priests and the king is doing well, and even in those times, it's like as the the leader rises and falls, so do the people. And and chapter one is all about the the, the leaders weren't leading well. The priests were not leading well. They didn't didn't have honesty. They weren't living with integrity. They weren't being godly. It was not good. It was not a good situation. And he's saying, you need to return to me, priests, and honor me. And then chapter two is about married people. They were making vows before God. Oh yeah, yeah, I won't cheat on her. Yeah, I vow to be with her for the rest of my life. And then they would turn around and just not. They were making vows before God and dishonoring God and their spouse. And God's saying, you need to return to me and and keep the marriage vows that you made. All right, and so this was like chapter two is is in the marriage. So it's it's the priests and then it's the homes and it's in marriage and and spouses and, and everything. And then it moves on to the area of finances. Chapter three the one that we hear a lot when it comes about preaching about finances, Malachi chapter three, it's about people not honoring God with their finances. And, and this has some very surprising language in it, which is what makes it so extreme to preach from and so exciting to preach from sometimes because the language is so extreme and it's so familiar because this was written thousands of years ago, right? I would say 2,500 years ago-ish, but today it's like, could be just as the same, the same thing could be said about, about us. Everyone would agree. And and listen to this, listen to this. Everyone would agree that those chapters in the new Testament should still be honored. Like Malachi chapter one, the priests weren't honoring God. Oh yeah, definitely leadership should have integrity, right? That's not just an old Testament principle, right? In the new Testament, that doesn't count anymore. No, of course they should. Of course, leaders should have integrity. Of course, leaders ought to be doing well. Of course, still in the New Testament, even though this was in Malachi, married people should still be keeping their vows. But the tithing issue, no, that's old. Well, let's throw out chapter three. Chapter one's good, two's good, four's good. No, three's out though. Three's weird. It's not right. Let's, let's throw that one out. It's just bizarre. It's bizarre that we, all the principles... And it's not so much law. The law was meant to articulate the way God has always felt all along. That's all the law ever was. It's not like he can't, hold on, we need some laws for these people. Like, let's, let's, Holy Spirit, let's come up with something. No, 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 no. This was always, the law was always intended to be a representation of what God's heart for his people were. That they would, that they would live with integrity. That they would be honest. That they would care for each other. That they wouldn't treat people with disrespect. Like, that's what all the law ever was. So before there was a law, this was insisted upon, there was a law, but now in the, in the New Testament times, we're in this new covenant, these things didn't go away. It's just, it's the true heart of the matter. It's the true heart of the matter. No, it's pretty obvious that tithing is still completely appropriate and expected behavior. So what does it say here? Let's, let's go over this passage that, that gets preached plenty of times, but I want to break it down for us. Malachi chapter three, verses six through 12 goes like this. I, the Lord, do not change. Point.
it's, I don't, I'm not teaching about generosity so much. This is not generosity. This is simply returning to God what he said belongs to him. Like the first 10% of everything is, is mine, says the Lord. And we get to choose what we do with it. We get to choose what we do with it. That's, that's, a more, that's a more accurate description of what's really going on. It's not a gift. It's not generosity. It's his. And a curse, what a curse means is a negative consequence. A curse is a negative consequence, just like a blessing is a positive consequence. If you do this, you'll be blessed. You'll have a positive consequence. But if you don't do this, or if you do something you shouldn't do, there'll be a curse on you, which is simply just a negative consequence. There's going to be negative consequences if we choose to keep what belongs to him. But, but reading on, reading on, verse 10, it says, bring the whole tithe, <laughs> which is funny because you don't have to bring me a whole quarter. It's just a quarter, right? It's funny that he uses whole tithe with a fraction. If this is a numeric term, but he says, bring the whole tithe that there may be food in my house. It's, it's hilarious to me because you would never go to a restaurant, you know, after, after this is over, you're going to all go out to eat and you're not going to sit down at the restaurant and say, Hey, uh, waiter, bring me a whole cheeseburger. Bring me a whole cheeseburger, you know, because, you know, I want the whole one. The only reason you would ever do that is if the waiter had a tendency of taking a few bites before he brought it, which is disgusting, <laughs> which is just gross. It's absolutely gross. No, bring me the, he says, bring it, bring the whole thing. And it's so funny because he could have been preaching in, in 2023, but back then it was no different. People, they, we they. I say they as if I'm not a human. <laughs> we have a tendency to, ah, but if I just save a little bit, I'll be better off. If I just, mm, if I just hold back a little bit, I'll be better. I'll be better off because I'll have more. It's, it's, it's normal. We all, we all think it. We all go there, but, but God is coming and say, bring that whole tithe into the storehouse. Food in the house. What's that mean? Food in the house is referring to spiritual food, like pastors giving a message and being able to preach the word and being able to teach that's spiritual food and then natural food. Like we do outreaches. We, we, we provide, you know, we do events that actually take care of people's needs and we are able to give spiritual and physical food at the rate that people are returning that tithe back in him. That's what food is referring to. Back then it was more or less literal food, but now that's what it's referring to. And that's the same principle is that there would be sustenance, both spiritual and physical. If there's going to be food in this house, people need to put it there. That's God's design. And G what Jesus did for us is free. Amen, somebody. We don't have to pay for it. But if we're going to go out there and reach the world, that's going to cost us. It's going to cost us. It's going to cost us something to do that. So what Jesus did for you is free. Like, I don't call the city of Lodi and say, hey, I'm preaching a free gospel over here. All right? You can go ahead and keep the electricity bill. What we're doing here is free. Okay? No, there's still going to be, like, we still have to pay bills and, and do whatnot. And you're like, well, then we should just meet in the, in, the, in the grass then. Let's just meet at the park. Really? You want to bring your, your unchurched, unsaved friends to a rainy park on a cloudy, cold day just because, we're not, because we don't want to bring anything? No, of course not. Of course. But if we think that through, man, we want to we wanna give God the best. We want to we wanna do what's best with, with God in mind and, and do everything like this at a high level. I would never call the city Lodi and ask for some kind of like, oh, you don't, don't pay us. God's plan is for us not to get government handouts. It's for the people of God to come together and we provide. We provide for each other and we provide for a lost and hurting world. It's not that we would scrimp and save. And of course, we're going to be frugal. We're going to manage well. We're going to steward our resources well. But it's going to come from us. It's what we bring to the table and this is God's design. So this is like the, in my opinion, the best part because it's the reward, if you will. It's, it's what God says he'll do. He says, test me in this. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see that I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be not enough room to store it all. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines of the fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Listen, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. His mission is the same, always has been, always will be. That's his mission. Steal, kill, and destroy. God says, if you do this, I'm going to block him. My hand of protection, that'll be the blessing. That'll be the positive consequence. My hand of blessing will be on you. 
the curse, the negative consequence is that God's hand of protection will be off. But here's the good thing about God is he still wants to bless you. And he wants to so much. But there's a principle at work here that we can tap into. It's just God's word. God says, choose life. Today I, I lay before you life and death. Choose life. Choose life. So we have a choice to make in our, in our spirituality. This is where the tithe challenge comes from. I haven't talked about it yet. I've been talking about it for a couple weeks already. But this is why we're doing the tithe challenge is because he says, test me in this. Test me in this. This is where we're letting people, like the church, the administration, the leaders, we're taking the brunt of the risk. And I've had leaders actually tell me, man, you didn't just let people sweat it out. Man, you're, you're, you're making it too easy for people. You're making it too easy. People ought to have to overcome that on their own. That's part of the blessing. And I hear what they're saying. I do. Like, I, I, I hear them. Like, what we're doing is, is like a risk-free 90 days. If God doesn't show up, we'll just give it back. Which some leaders would say, man, you're just like, you're taking all the blessing out of it. I don't think so. Because guess what? That 90 days is going to run out. <laughs> and there'll be some, there'll be challenges that, that come after 90 days. Believe me. <laughs> But this is why we're doing that is because God says, this is the one area God says we can test him. One area that God says we can test him. I would encourage you, it's in the, it's in the bulletin, it's in the seat backs. Scan that little code, check it out. We made a lot of resources so that we could teach you about giving and we are ready to partner with you. The testimonies, I mean, this is week three. So we've had two full weeks of tithe challenge and I just got another testimony this morning. Another testimony this morning, someone texted me and said, hey, as soon as I you know, trusted God and, and did that, someone came through and, and shot a, uh, what do they call it? The, the Mo, the Vin, Venmo? I'm so old, I know. <laughs> I'm so embarrassed right now. <laughs> someone came through and Someone who didn't know, someone else who didn't know what they had done came through and said, you know what? The Lord just put you on my heart and bam, dropped a blessing. There's other testimonies that I can see that haven't come to me yet, but I've heard about them. I've seen them. I'm like, I see it happening in the family, but I haven't, I don't, I don't have permission yet. But the reason we're doing this is not because we need anything. The reason we're, 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 we're taking the brunt of the risk and letting you test God in doing it the right way, the right amount, the right place at the right time. The reason why we're setting the table up like that is because we want to give you the opportunity to, to taste and see that he is good. He's faithful. He loves you. He wants to support you. He loves to bless you. He wants to. I know some of you might be thinking, man, I'm, I feel pretty good right now. I don't, I don't feel cursed. You know, this whole like, if I start tithing, I'll be blessed kind of thing. I already feel like things are kind of good. What I would say back to that is imagine if God did show up, what might change? What's, what's being hindered? What's being stopped? What's kind, what is the enemy steal, killing, and destroying that you're not even noticing? That's not even, the, that you can't even see, that you won't see that breakthrough until you, until you experience this level of faith. This is a, this is a, hard word. I know that's a, that's a big word right now that I'm giving to you to, to take this step. But those of us that have done it, those of us that have been doing it, we know the Lord is faithful. We know the Lord is always taking care of our every single need. Even when things go wrong, we know he's going to show up. We know he's going to come through and he always, always does. If I said it once, I'll say it three more times. We don't need anything from you. We want everything for you. We want you to experience God's blessing in a brand new way in your life. This blessing may not even be financial. It might be relational. It might be health. It could be any number of blessings. The enemy steal, kills, and destroys in every area of your life. So God's going to rebuke the devourer in every area of your life. And he's going to show up in ways that you, oh, I'm just so excited for you. I'm so excited for you. I encourage you, take this challenge. Go, go all in in that area of your heart that might not be surrendered uh, to God. I could tell you that through your giving that there's been, in 2023 alone, there's been a 50% increase in people that call Lifeline Church their home from January to, what month is it? 
into October. I know, I know stuff. I know so many things. <sighs> From January to October, 50% with dozens of salvations to go along with that, that people are, are, are putting their faith in Christ. I can tell you that through your giving, that is being made possible. I could tell you that through your giving, we've given over $2,000 to help plant new churches in the USA. I could tell you that uh, through your giving, we've given another two th over $2,000 to Israel before they were even at war because we're trying to bless the, God's people and reach people for Jesus even in Israel. I could tell you that we've given thousands of dollars to Foursquare Missions Press. We've given it to Foursquare Missions International. We've, through your giving, so much has happened. I could tell you all those things to try and validate, validate our ministry to you and show you how your giving is making a difference. But what I really want to leave you with is this, the most famous passage of scripture ever uttered. This is how God loved the world. He gave. He gave. God so loved the world that he gave his first and his best. God did it first. God went first. And what he gave was so much more valuable than anything we'll ever give him. And what he truly wants is your life, your heart, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. We are most like God when we give our first and our best. That is how we are most like God. And we are all here today because God gave his first and his best. I would be dead in the ground if it wasn't for the grace of God. I have had many near-death experiences when I was in my drug addiction, I was in my alcoholism, I was in my using. I, there, I know God's hand of, of protection was on me. So it wasn't just in response to my faithfulness that he protected me. He protects us before we're faithful to him with what's his. He is. And that's, that's what I'm trying to say is that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still screw-ups, Christ died for us. While we were still misbehaving, Christ died for us. He gave his first and his best before there was any payoff, before there was any promise, before he knew if you were gonna come to him or not, he gave. But he, he, he wants you, he wants you. He doesn't want your money, he wants you, he wants your heart, he wants your life. He wants what that gesture represents. What he really wants is you, your whole life, all of it, no secret spaces. No, God, I'll give you every area of my life. I'll give you my purity. I'll give you my integrity. I'll give you my anger. I'll give you my finances. I'll give you all the areas, Lord, that I struggle with. I'll give it all to you. That's what he really wants is all of us. While we were still sinners, that's exactly what he did. He gave. So I would encourage us to, if that's you today, just start right here. Just start right here and give God your heart but let everything else follow. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes in prayer. I wanna give you an opportunity just to come back to him. I know many of you uh, have probably heard of the name of the Lord before. Maybe you haven't. Maybe some of you have walked with the Lord before. Maybe some of you haven't. But regardless where you stand, whether this is a come back to Jesus moment or come to Jesus for the first time moment, God looks at that he is so eager for you. He's so eager for your heart. He loves you. He wants you. He cares for you. He gave his son just to have an opportunity with you. So if I've described you in any way, and if this message has kind of tagged your heart with, with surrender and with giving, would you just lift your hand for me and so I know who I'm about to pray for? Just go ahead. Be bold. Lift up your hand and say, that's me. Amen. I see you. Amen. Is there anyone else? Amen. Hallelujah. So good. Church family, what I'd love for us to do is pray together. Let's pray together as a family to just commit ourselves to him. Say, I'm ready to go all in. So let's pray. Pray it right after me if this is your heart. Say, Father God, I give you my heart, all of my heart, all of the places where I'm reluctant and scared and nervous. But Lord, I trust you and I give it all to you knowing that you will carry me. Forgive me of my sin. Make me new. 
Fill me with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, everybody. Let's go.